One, the Chet Anger Production Company. Jackie here is like a lot of people. She has relatives living in Florida. On Discover the World of Science, working to save Florida's endangered manatees. We'll also meet Valerie, a true bionic woman who programs her own body. We'll follow a solar car race if the sun's out. And we'll see why modern medicine is learning an ancient practice, meditation. I'm Peter Graves. Join me now on Discover the World of Science. Discover the World of Science is made possible by a grant from a major producer of lighting products, of precision materials, and a world leader in products and services for telecommunications. The company is GTE. Meet Jackie. She's from Africa. She's big, she's beautiful, as you can see, she's a strict vegetarian, and she's closely related to a little-known animal living right here in America, the manatee. But Jackie shares something else with her American cousins. The future of both species is in doubt, and for the manatee, it's getting critical. Florida. It's a chilly winter morning on the Gulf Coast. United States Fish and Wildlife biologists Jim Reed and Bob Bondi are looking for manatees. And around here, they're as easy to find as pelicans. There's a couple coming a couple up to us. Manatees must be about the friendliest wild animals on Earth. This manatee has come up to chew on the algae that's trailing from this small line that's attached to the back of the boat. They're very curious animals. In some situations, it ends up getting them in trouble, and they end up chewing on crab trap lines and inadvertently getting it wrapped around their flippers, or they end up swallowing pieces of line and ultimately end up dying from internal obstructions. There's something the manatees have discovered about this area on Florida's west coast. Regularly during the winter, they come in from the Gulf and swim up the Crystal River heading for Kings Bay. There, close to one of the islands, they found a huge freshwater spring. Now, manatees like freshwater, but even more, they like warm water. And here, as it comes up through the limestone, it's a steady 74 degrees year-round. Around the spring are lush beds of vegetation. Strangely enough, these plants are an introduced type. They're used in aquariums, but some got away, and now they're widespread. A nuisance for all but the manatees. It's probably one reason that in the last 30 years, this has become a major manatee winter area. There's a small manatee winter sanctuary here, no human intrusion allowed. And it's a haven for much else besides. The 
Biologists check out the manatees here every week in winter, and they're never alone. Diving with the manatees is becoming a big tourist attraction. Usually there are plenty of animals outside the sanctuary boundaries to delight the visitors with their placid ways and apparently complete unconcern at human intrusion. But as the biologists are only too well aware, the gentle manatee pays dearly for its lifestyle. This terrible wound was caused by a boat propeller. Jim Reed records it as he does for all new wounds. Another one. There's hardly an animal here that's unmarked. A female with her six-month-old calf. Already the young one is scarred, while the mother displays the lasting result of an earlier propeller impact. These wounds are so recognizable that the biologists have turned them to good use. As they've done for the last four winters, Jim and Bob sort through the week's pictures. Scar patterns are spotted, previous sightings are matched up, the changing population is tracked. Gradually, manatee biology, a mystery ten years ago, is unfolding. In the future, they'll recognize this male whenever he returns to Crystal River. Who's this one? This one... That's uh, Maggie. Frame 17 would be her calf. The calf has two little prop scars on it. The crucial question applies to the females. How often do they produce a calf? According to this study, not often it seems. Only every two or three years. Another basic question about the manatees. How many are there? Regularly in winter, biologists take to the air. John Reynolds is one of them. You got some in there? Yeah, yeah, a few. Oh, about 30 or 40 maybe, yeah. Power plants are big attractions for manatees during cold spells. They huddle into the waste heat outlet channels, the perfect target for a biologist's camera. Simultaneously, other researchers make counts at Crystal River and the rest of the known concentration points. Here, John Reynolds has seen close to 300 animals. America's manatee population, and they exist only in Florida, is now put at 1,200. But that's an uncertain number in a hazy overall picture. We know what we see, but we don't know how many we miss when we do surveys. We don't know whether the population's going up or down. We don't have historical data. We have a, a rough idea of how many die per year. That's in the neighborhood of 125. But we, don't, we just don't know whether there's enough new ones, babies, coming into the population to offset that mortality. Because an alarming portion of that mortality, about 40 a year, is caused by man, mainly in boats, the state has imposed speed limits around key areas like power plants. The critical facts in this idle speed are, number one, that the boat goes slow enough that the manatee, if he's up taking a breath of air, he has time to get back down before he gets struck by the boat. And the second problem we find is when they get going a little bit too fast, they actually drag the rear end of the boat down deeper into the water so that those propellers are turning deeper and deeper and, the, you know, they're doing more harm then. So it's very important that they understand what a true idle speed is. Dipper, take your boat out of gear. I'll be coming on your port side. You're all going to have to be more conscientious of this manatee zone. That's too fast in there. I know you don't want to hit one of them. I'm sure you don't want to do that, all right? Watch your water. A good way to tell is you look at the back of your boat. If you're peeling off that white water off the back of the boat, it's too fast. You need to get it down to an idle speed. SeaWorld in Orlando. It's a great show. Some visitors take a tour behind the scenes. Does anyone know what these are? Any guesses? Sea cows, right. right. Manatees. They've been given the name, nickname the sea cow. That's because of their natural grazing ability. Now, we were lucky we had a baby manatee born here this past July. The parents were Rita and Jean. They both were brought to us through the Beached Animal Program. 
Here, the visitors see the lucky ones, the survivors of accidents brought in while their wounds heal. This male fathered a calf that was born here. The mother was badly injured too. She lost a flipper. There's an orphan, probably about eight months old, being hand reared. Every baby manatee is precious because biologists estimate that 1,200 animals can produce up to 120 new calves a year. And that at best is only enough to replace the 120 found dead each year. Is this the relentless arithmetic of extinction? Once they ranged from Texas to Central and South America, now Florida is one of their last strongholds. So what's to be done? The key problem is boats. In spite of the speed zones, manatee deaths from boat impacts are still going up. So State Marine Mammal Coordinator Pat Rose is developing unprecedented protection plans. There have to be fewer boats. How will he do it? In a development-minded state, he will restrict the boat docks that everyone wants. If we are not able to implement the recommendations that we'll come forth with in our protection plans, there really is not, I wouldn't be optimistic at all, because without direct intervention, without major changes occurring in, in the way that manatees are protected in the future in Florida, they are literally doomed. This is a manatee trap, close to Kennedy Space Center on Florida's east coast. The water here is brackish, so the freshwater hose offers tempting refreshment to passing manatees. A team from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is in the process of investigating the summer movements of manatees after they leave the warm water concentrations. But first, catch the manatee. He'll stop struggling if they can pull him into shallow water. Easier said than done with this lively young male who weighs about 800 pounds. Finally, he calms down and they can start fitting the specially designed tail collar. There's a lot of milk. Jim and Bob are careful about the fit. Not too constricting, and yet not so loose that it will fall off. Beautiful. A little bigger. The best, the most fighting manatee of them all. Next, a radio transmitter with enough battery power for two years of operation. The team notes a small propeller scar on his back, now well healed. And then with the transmitter attached to the collar, it's time for release. That picks out. You got it. All right, Bill. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Watch your Leader of the team, biologist Tom O'Shea. As you can see, the animal took off nicely. It was uh, an animal that only had one propeller mark on it, which is fairly unusual on the east coast of Florida. Most manatees on the east coast have multiple wounds from multiple accidents with boats. Um, so we'll take it from here and see where he goes. Our young manatee evaded detection. His transmitter was found a few days later with alligator teeth marks on it. Now we're tracking Dixie. She's a female who was tagged down at a power plant in the winter and then detected up close to Kennedy Space Center in June. Dixie likes to summer in the quiet channels around the Space Center. The goal is to expand our knowledge of the habitat important to manatees when they move out of their limited winter areas. She's about 100 meters ahead of us 
and we're going to slowly approach her. We're not going to get very close. We want to see if she still has her little calf with her. Um, you know, I think she's moving this way. Yeah, she sure is. If we, could, we could anchor up in this little flat. Let's try that. Uh, she, she might, might, she come might to just us. come by us. Watch the cord. You try to clean it off. Yeah. She's so really unafraid of boats and comes so close out of natural curiosity that it's an aspect of her personality that's going to get her in trouble. Yeah. Many manatees are that way. She's coming up again. So far, it seems there's little of the Florida coastline, east and west, that manatees don't use in the summer. But it's going to take several more years before the detailed pattern emerges. Meanwhile, pressure on the manatee is just not going to let up. Tom O'Shea. The problems the animals face are directly related to the, the growth of the state, and we have to accommodate the animals um, as we accommodate the human growth. And they're extremely adaptable animals. That's one of the things that we have learned from our, our research and just by being with the animals. They'll, they'll come to a place like Crystal River where 20 or 30 years ago there were probably no manatees and the populations will increase there to a couple hundred animals this year. Um, they'll adapt to feeding on food that didn't exist in Florida a um, hundred years ago, introduced exotic vegetation. They'll adapt to drinking out of freshwater hoses uh, for their freshwater needs. Uh, they'll adapt to being hit and scarred by boat propellers, and almost every animal is. Um, they're tough, uh, they're resilient. Uh, if we just give them a chance, I think we can keep them around. Summer camp, the place where so many of us first learned those wonderful and confusing lessons about life and about relationships. I suppose in that respect, this camp is no different, but the boys who are here have something else on their minds. They're all diabetic, and they're learning not so much about life as about how literally to stay alive. Right now, the kitchen is preparing breakfast, but before the boys can tackle a simple thing like eating it, there are some things to which they must pay absolute attention. The first order of the day is to check blood sugar. Would you like me to do it, or do you want to do it? I'll do it. You want to do it? You can, do it. You can prick me. This machine will tell camper Ryan Johnson how much undigested sugar remains in his blood. Sugar derived from the starches in last night's dinner. If Ryan were not diabetic, his body would sense this blood sugar and release insulin to break it down. But his pancreas, the organ that should do this job, doesn't work. This is camp nurse Lori Blake. What do you think you're going to be, Ryan? Um, hi. She's teaching Ryan to do what his pancreas can't. Several times a day, he has to perform this test. And like most diabetics, his blood sugar often rises to damaging levels. Three six. Three six. Today, it's three times what it should be. Insulin injections will control the blood sugar, but they can't match the finely tuned and automatic control of a healthy pancreas. Like all diabetics, Ryan's insulin will be time-released, peaking yeah. after each meal time. So the hour of the morning insulin shot determines their eating schedule for the whole day. It's a big responsibility on young shoulders. Right. Camp director Paul Madden understands firsthand because he too is diabetic. There are always stresses on you in life and those stresses can impact on, on the blood sugar level. Uh, always times when uh, someone will rush you out the door when you don't have time to slow down, take your blood sugar test, do your insulin. So a lot of those things go on, on every day. And even though the youngster may conquer it and deal with it well on Monday, 
Tuesday, they may have a more difficult time. For the one million diabetics in this country, the routine of insulin injections and blood sugar checks is a daily life-saving event. But on the horizon is some rapidly advancing technology that could change their lives. An implantable device that will, at least in part, act like a real pancreas. Back at camp, it's now breakfast time. And like all meals, it begins with some weighing and measuring. The goal? Regulate the amount of carbohydrate eaten so the blood sugar it produces will precisely match this morning's insulin dose. The strict diet and the constant attention to food are often the very hardest part about having diabetes as a child. I don't get much food ever. And my brothers always eat cookies and stuff, and I'm sitting there watching them. But I have self-control so I can stand it. And another thing that I don't like is I have to be active all the time. I can never rest because I want my blood sugars to be low, not high, because if they're high, it'll damage my body tissues. And that's the problem. These boys look healthy, but because blood sugar regulation by injection can never be perfect, they will always be vulnerable. Over the long term, high blood sugar can cause loss of vision, kidney failure, and circulation damage. But the delicate balance of exercise, diet, and insulin can also tip the other way. Low blood sugar, when insulin peaks and doesn't have anything to work on, that can be a daily event for some diabetics. Right now, Brian Hogan Camp is getting tired and confused. Symptoms that his sugar is starting to fall. He needs to raise his blood sugar immediately, or he may soon become unconscious. How do you feel? I don't feel, I don't feel tired. I'm really tired so you're definitely low? Yeah. Paul Madden is on the sidelines with a packet of honey. It's a quick sugar source. Is one gonna be enough? <laughs> Kevin has become resigned to living with a disease that controls his life. I've had it since I was one and a half years old, and I learned to live with it. You know, it's not that I don't like it. I figure, while I have it, make the best of it, you know, so. A life without diabetes is something most of the children here at camp dream of. I don't think I'll have diabetes for the rest of my life. I think they'll come out with a cure. They already have an artificial pancreas out. They just have to perfect it. But um, I hate when they perfect it because it takes five years to do it. Bless us, O oh Lord, and these I guess. Which it's an important see. evening for the Krauss family in Baltimore, Maryland. And the cause of the celebration is something close well, sure to an artificial pancreas. Now. The reason we're celebrating today <laughs> is because Valerie after 16 years of giving herself a needle and sometimes more a day, she will no longer have... Valerie has had diabetes since she was 12 years old. But now, in her day-to-day -day battle to control her blood sugar levels, she's about to enlist the help of a remarkable invention from Johns Hopkins University. Inside her body, a pump will soon secrete insulin throughout the day. I think that the... The pump will change my life for the better because I won't feel as trapped or tied in. I'll have more flexibility to, I'll, I'll feel like I'm in control of the diabetes, that it's not controlling my life, that I'm controlling it. Over the years, fluctuations in Valerie's blood sugar have led to some typical complications of diabetes. She has begun to show signs of eye damage. The pump's fine-tuned release of insulin promises to stop these fluctuations, although Valerie will still have to watch her diet and check her blood sugar regularly. The pump was designed here at Johns Hopkins by Robert Fischel. Implants, he believes, are on a kind of mission to inner space. An implant in a body has a lot of characteristics that are really quite similar to a spacecraft in orbit. Both of them have to be really small and lightweight, very reliable, and what's also very important is that you're able to speak to them or change the way they operate by a radio command and also to receive data from them by radio telemetry. 
Valerie will relay remote control signals to her pump, for example, when she needs extra insulin before a meal. The pump's computer will translate her commands into action. At the same time, the implant will deliver a constant baseline insulin dose. This steady flow will help prevent damaging blood sugar highs and lows. The battery is state-of-the-art, built to last five years. It powers the pumping mechanism, which will squirt out insulin millions of times during the pump's life. Enough concentrated insulin is held in this chamber to last three months before being refilled by syringe. Here, Robert Fischel fills the insulin reservoir with a test fluid. And this is the handheld remote control used to communicate with the pump as it secretes insulin drop by drop. It's time for Valerie to receive her implant. Although the device is still experimental, the surgery itself is relatively simple. Dr. Christopher Saudek, director of the trials, draws up concentrated insulin for transfer to the pump. 9. Dr. Sodek will not press the plunger. Right. The implant, under negative pressure, itself draws in the insulin. It's a safety feature. Later, when the reservoir is refilled through the skin, a misplaced syringe cannot inject the possibly lethal insulin dose. Tag. The pump will be implanted just below the surface of the abdomen. Once it's in place, Dr. Sodek sends the pump its first command. The remote control that Valerie will soon carry with her tells the pump to begin its baseline secretion. One last check. Dr. Sodek listens for the click of an operating pump. All right, it's working. There is a moment of truth when you have the patient all closed up and uh, we do test the function of the pump to see that it's working. We are very happy to hear each time when the command is delivered and appropriately received by the pump. Two months later, for Valerie and her boyfriend Tom, a beautiful afternoon for a summer stroll along the harbor. They take a pause so Valerie can check her blood sugar. If her pump could do this, it truly would be an artificial pancreas. Valerie measures it and will use this information to decide which command she'll give her pump before dinner. In the months since the pump was installed, her blood sugar control is much improved, and so is the control of her life. The time of their dinner was not dictated by a morning injection, and she's free to eat as much or as little as she likes. We'll be having the pesto chicken, and uh, I'll have the Hawaiian mahi mahi. Valerie mentally translates her order into carbohydrate content and concludes that she'll need additional insulin beyond the baseline rate. So she tells her remote control to command her pump to deliver the extra units. If Valerie's experience so far is any indication, in the future, there may be a lot more victims of diabetes who can look forward to a major improvement in their lives. I don't miss the needles, I don't miss the, the insulin, I, I don't miss anything about that. I don't miss the, the rigidity of, of the meals and, and all of that involved. Um, just, I love what's happened with the pump, it's great. A car like this 57 Ford, you used to be able to drive just for the fun of it. It didn't really make any difference, the gas mileage wasn't so good, because back in those days, a tank full of gas only cost you five dollars. <laughs> Fill it up, please. But when oil prices went through the roof in the 70s, gas guzzlers like this one became a thing of the past. And car designers began looking for alternatives. Well, that search has developed some very unusual automobiles, which won't ever 
I have to stop at a gas station. Solar cars, powered just by the energy of the sun. It's the spring of 1987, and over 100 cars like this are on their way to Switzerland, and this year's Tour de Sol. That's the World Championship Solar Car Race. It's gonna be a grueling event as these specially designed cars fight it out for six days, rain or shine. They all use the same basic layout. Sunlight hits the solar panels. It's converted to electrical energy, which is stored in batteries. They drive the motors and through a transmission, the wheels. Sound simple? Not really. The designer has to juggle a lot of different factors. Battery capacity, power, weight, efficiency, and reliability. It's 2 a.m. and there's a police escort for one of the strangest cars you'll ever see. Just two weeks before the race, a team from MIT started road testing America's only Tour de Sol entry. The car's been running well, but now it looks like there are problems in the complex electronic control systems. Somebody hold on to the car. Uh, I just saw a pretty bright light down there. Where, where do you put it? It's taken six months to get to this stage. Six months of designing, building, redesigning, rebuilding. For the seven team members, students of electronics, materials, and mechanics, there's now only one goal, get it finished and get to Switzerland. Mechanical engineer Eric Valor. We have a car that's been running for two weeks now. Uh, we're taking care of all the little details that we just kept putting off until the end, and this is the end. Beale, Switzerland, the starting point for Tour de Sol 1987. But before the race begins, the competitors still have one last hurdle to cross, a rigorous testing of the construction of their cars. These solar racers have to meet the same safety standards as regular cars and the judges pay special attention to the brakes. Some cars, like this rather unsteady looking contraption, just don't meet the standards, and the officials won't let them compete in the race. It's always the problem that we are interested that the cars can drive, but it's also a problem of security if they are not um, able to, um, to drive, and if they are dangerous, we prefer not to let them drive. No problems for this car, though. It's last year's world champion, built right here in Beale at the local engineering school. And the hometown team is a hot favorite in this year's race. <laughs> and nearly 4,000 miles from home, MIT has finally made it. The car is almost unrecognizable from when we last saw it. The frame is covered by a carbon fiber body shell and the solar panels are in place. Behind the wheel, 20-year-old Jim Worden, principal designer and engineer. Project supervisor Professor Harry West in the hat talks to officials as they begin their safety checks. Now, the brake test. It's an unsatisfactory performance, and a weak braking system could disqualify them. It's a little bit concerned about the quality of the construction of the brakes, and they're now checking what we've done. Jim is persuading them that we've used the highest quality aircraft cable, and therefore it will survive uh, repeated braking. A second try. Jim Worden applies maximum pressure, and they've passed. Ahead of them, 275-mile course through Switzerland, Austria, and Liechtenstein, all on public roads. The first day, a 65-mile stage from Biel to Emmen. Jim Worden is looking good in the MIT car. 
He's level on time with the world champion Beale team, which, with an earlier position at the start, is already out in open country. But only a few miles from the start, yeah, under the solar panel. Dave, where's Dave? there's trouble for MIT, and every second counts. Transmission is very high. What? Is this? No, oh, it should be in the spot. Now it's in the spot. It's still not in neutral. Leave it in the spot. Transmission wrench. Nobody's quite sure what's wrong, but the transmission is apparently overheating, and Jim struggles to adjust the gear shift. Meanwhile, the invincible Beale car continues to set the pace. Their only challenge seems to be getting past the locals. Jim has struggled on for a few more miles, but he still hasn't fixed the problem. It's on fire! One of the motors is burned out. The hot sunny weather may be a factor, raising the temperature inside the carbon fiber body shell to well over 100 degrees. And the team comes up with a drastic solution. They're forced to trade aerodynamic efficiency for some simple ventilation. Wire wraps, wire wraps, quick, industrial wire wrap, the white one. No, leave that! With one motor destroyed and the other two damaged, Jim once again sets off in pursuit of the leaders. Push, push, push. No, it's used to sound. But his top speed is down to 20 miles an hour, and the competition is getting away from him. It's turning into a terrible day for MIT. There's not enough power for the gentlest of slopes. Is there? Oh boy. The car is still badly overheating. Jim is convinced the problem lies in the motors. What we need is some kind of, any kind of electric, DC electric motor. Um, I don't know if any of these are gonna work anymore. I've gotta keep the batteries from melting. Finally, they get to the bottom of it. All of their problems stem from a tiny chip of metal caught in the transmission. The gears have seized up, and that has led to the overheating of the motors and the batteries. The solution? Rebuild the transmission, reassemble the car. But as Harry West realizes, it's probably too late. I think it means that we're essentially we're out of the running for winning the race overall. There's no doubt about that at this stage. However, I think we can fix the car this afternoon and crawl into Emmons sometime this evening. After three hours' work, the car is back on the road. It's running smoothly for the first time. It looks like MIT may still be able to finish the race. Even if they can't challenge the Beale car, now five hours ahead of them and in a virtual tie for first place with an unexpected rival, the Solaris team, also from Switzerland. It's the end of the second day and the competitors take advantage of the bright Zurich sunshine to recharge their batteries. But ironically, the sunny weather is the biggest threat to the Beale team's chances. Meticulously engineered, their car is like an energy-efficient compact. By comparison, the faster, more powerful Solaris runs like an old gas guzzler. No problem so long as energy or sunlight is abundant. Well, so far, it has been. And if it stays this way, Solaris could be the next world champion. And on a sunny day three, they take the lead. At the end of day three in St. Gallen, MIT is still in the race, but everybody's watching the weather. Good lightning hit here. It could be a crucial moment. The gas-guzzling Solaris has had the sunny weather to thank for full batteries and a 10-minute lead. If the weather turns bad, they could be running on empty within a few miles. 
It's no better the next morning. Okay. None of the cars has been able to recharge. When we started up uh, the solar panel this morning, we were charging at about 10 watts, uh, which means that we need about three months to get our batteries charged. So uh, I think it's going to be a pretty slow race for just about everybody today. The batteries on Solaris were only 30% full when they arrived in St. Gallen, and they're still at that level as they prepare to leave. The economical Beale car, 60% full, has a clear edge. And it takes an early lead. But when the weather suddenly clears up, their advantage disappears. Now cars can recharge their batteries directly as they drive, and Solaris can once again get all the power it needs. Things are looking brighter for Jim Worden. With the MIT car running superbly, he's passing everything in sight. At the end of that disastrous first day, he finished 72nd overall. But now he's moved up nearly 40 places in the standings with one day left in the race. That final stage is the shortest but the most challenging. 4,000-foot climb from Kur to the village of Arosa. The Solaris team just has to wait for the sun to fill their batteries. But the Beale team, now 15 minutes behind, installs a powerful new motor in a bid to close the gap. It's like putting a V8 engine in a Chevette. The Beale car leads up the twisting mountain road but they still can't pull away from the following cars by more than a minute. And for Solaris, third place on the day is good enough for the overall victory and this year's world championship. Back down the mountain, Jim Worden is also making good time. Some of the cars find it pretty difficult to make it up the steepest sections of the road. But Jim is finishing strongly. For the team from MIT, it's been quite a week. I was delighted with the way the team performed and coped with adversity. We fought back from 72nd place all the way back to 15th place in our group. And that's a remarkable achievement, I think, for the students involved and for everybody else who's helped us out. This is the first session of our hypertension group program, and today I'll be instructing you in a technique which will be helpful. Here at Boston's New England Deaconess Hospital, this group of patients with high blood pressure is about to receive a prescription for their problem. It is one of the recommended treatments for mild hypertension, and surprisingly, it has nothing to do with drugs. I'll be teaching you a simple technique to bring forth a state of being or physiology that we call the relaxation response. I'll ask that you practice this technique each day for 20 minutes, and that you do it first thing in the morning when you get up. In our story, we're going to hear a lot about the relaxation response and how it's being applied today in medicine and even in sports. It's very simple to do. If you want to try it, here's how. First, I'd like you to sit up straight and get yourself comfortable in the chair. And you do this in a quiet spot at home. Next, closing your eyes, feet on the floor, hands on your lap. Take a deep breath in and out, deeply relaxing all of your muscles, starting from your toes right up to your head. Now focus your attention on a word, thought, or phrase. If distracting thoughts come to mind, simply passively disregard them and come back to your focus of attention. And we'll continue in this way for the next 20 minutes. 
red, blue, green, blue, Faster, green, please. red, green, red, blue, red, Faster. green, red, blue, green, red, green, red, blue, green. This red, volunteer blue, green, is under psychological red, stress. Blue, green, red, green, blue, green, the aim is blue, to find out green, green, what that stress is doing to his body. Red, blue, red, green, Cardiologist green, Dr. Green, Herbert green, Benson green, of Harvard Medical green, School green, has spent 20 green, years green, studying mind-body interactions. Blue, green, blue, green, the volunteer is connected to a machine that monitors his heart rate which started at 67, and blood pressure starting at 145 over 79. Blue, red, green, blue, red. The task gets harder. Now he has to speak aloud the color and not the word. Blue, red, blue. As tension increases in the subject's mind, an emergency response is provoked in his body. Green, red, faster. This so-called fight or flight response includes faster breathing. Blue. Heart rate up 41 points. Blood pressure 165 over 93, up from 145 over 79. And higher levels of stress hormones in his blood. It's important to understand the extent to which mind interacts with body because many diseases may be caused by such mind-body reactions or may be made worse by such mind-body reactions. Okay, let's see how you High pressure blood pressure is. is one such disease. If stress and the fight or flight response make blood pressure higher, Dr. Benson wondered if inducing an opposite response could make it lower. For several years now, he's been studying what he calls the relaxation response. During the relaxation response, there's decreased metabolism, decreased blood pressure, decreased heart rate, decreased rate of breathing, a stabilization, of muscle blood flow, and psychological feelings of peace and tranquility. For the past three months, along with a program of diet and exercise, Mrs. Anita Gorman has daily practiced the relaxation response and is now finally getting control over blood pressure, which despite numerous medications has been as high as 170 over 110. Uh, 142 over 86 the very best I've had in 22 years. There are immediate benefits to the elicitation of the relaxation response, immediate physiologic changes. But the changes carry over into other periods of the day. Specifically, the body is less sensitive to one of the major stress hormones. So now, whenever Mrs. Gorman is in stressful situations, her body reacts more calmly to the alarm signals from her mind. In other cultures, the mind's effect on the body has been explored for centuries. A few years ago, the Dalai Lama invited Dr. Benson and a team including filmmakers Russell Paraso and Mike Edwards to witness an extraordinary religious discipline practiced by Tibetan Buddhist monks. This secret ceremony has never previously been seen by outsiders, and the film shot on that occasion is shown here for the first time. In a prayer room only a few degrees above freezing, the monks dip sheets in buckets of ice water and drape them around their near-naked bodies. Within five minutes, in a state of advanced meditation called Tumo Yoga, the sheets begin to steam dry. Sensors showed that the meditating monks raised their skin temperature by as much as 15 degrees Fahrenheit in a cold environment where skin temperature would normally decrease. This extreme example of the power of mind over body, acquired only after years of practice, raises the possibility of using simpler meditation techniques like the relaxation response in more everyday situations. Uh, in the lower back, it's a stabbing feeling, like somebody's taking a knife, stabbing it in my back and twisting it. Mm -hmm. And the other pain is the pain that goes down my legs, the sciatica pain, which is a shooting pain. It's a, a pain that's deep inside my legs. It's not like up near the skin. It's more like in by the bone, a nerve yeah. pain. Like when the dentist hits the nerve of a tooth. Bill yeah, Becker has come to Dr. Richard Friedman after eight years of living in constant pain from two crushed discs in his back. Dr. Friedman of the State University of New York at Stony Brook has recently begun using the relaxation response as a way of calming his patient's response to chronic pain. The idea is that the relaxation response will reduce the tension in Bill's body, allowing him to pay less attention to his pain, but he's skeptical. 
And after the first few weeks, results are mixed. I really had one lousy week. But the only thing is, I just feel like I handled my lousy week a little better. I know where you are, Bill, and I know that you're in pain. I can read the numbers, and I see the agonizing, and I see the excruciating, and I see the miserable. You can see the difference but I also hear you taking one step in the other direction for the first time. Not for the first time since you knew me for four weeks. For the first time in eight years, you say, you know what? I'm doing something that's a little positive. Not a doctor giving me an injection, not somebody popping a pill for me. That's true. I'm doing something. That's true. This and what something I'm doing is good. Control yeah. Over, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point, Rich. And, 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 okay. <laughs> and, 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 well, and, and, good point. And, and let's just keep working on it, you know? Okay. And I'm very optimistic. A month later, and the first indication that the relaxation response may be helping. Bill used to play darts at the national tournament level. The injury to his back ended that. The pain of standing was too intense. But now the relaxation response has made him less anxious and angry about his pain, allowing him to cope with it better and once again pick up the sport he loves. I think that um, I've gotten good results. I think the result for the short time, five weeks, uh, the results aren't dramatic, but, but there, are, there are results and the results are positive. So I have nothing to lose by continuing. Uh, who knows, maybe I'll get better. Today, research on applications of the relaxation response has gone beyond the clinic and into the sports arena. Chuck Sherline recently took part in an experiment at the University of Illinois to see if the relaxation response could improve his running form. Chuck is a long distance runner and his problem was trying too hard, tensing up during running and wasting energy that could be going into speed and distance. Seconds. Jeff Simons, a sports psychologist now at the University of Southern California, designed the six-week experimental program. The first step was to find out how well Chuck performed before the program as a basis for later comparisons. A good measure of running efficiency is how much oxygen he uses up at different speeds. Less oxygen means he's running efficiently, more oxygen, and he's wasting energy somewhere, probably in keeping his muscles tensed. Increasing the grade while he keeps running at full speed tests Chuck's limits of endurance. Before the program, he could go flat out uphill for 61 seconds before exhaustion. The first part of this program is uh, learning to control muscle Then the training in the relaxation response began. Put your arms and rest them on the armrest. I'd like for you just to close your eyes. Other runners in the control group were not taught. In the first few weeks, Chuck's daily runs were still marked with tension, even though he was practicing the relaxation response twice a day. Then Jeff taught him to elicit the response while he was running. Using silent cue words like relax or smooth, he could call to mind the experience of the relaxation response. And gradually, noticeable in his face and shoulders, there began to be a change. Things are going pretty well. Um, Chuck felt he was, was conquering his tension, problem. but at the expense of speed. When I was out practicing relaxation on the track in practices, it In fact, like he was afraid he was relaxing too much. Relax, I'm slowing down. And, now uh, he was ready for the final problem. step in the program, well, that's, combining that's the problem. relaxation I mean, that's, that's response with mental relax. imagery. Another fantastic feature of the relaxation response is that it allows you to get into a state where your mind is very open to imagery and suggestion, self-suggestion, and positive types of, of, of thoughts and plans. What Jeff and I decided on, uh, essentially, was the running of a cheetah at full speed. We watched a film, and the muscles on a cheetah actually just flop. And at its full speed, it is totally relaxed. And that mental image is the one of a perfect runner, which is the one I'm ultimately uh, in search of. The imagery and relaxation are combined by first eliciting the relaxation response. This opens up the mind for the images. There's a greater ability to manipulate the images. So you would call them up and play through the visions of the cheetah, the power, the form, the grace, the speed. And then in a sense, program yourself to be like that cheetah. A powerful mind experience 
the relaxation response and mental imagery, but was it affecting his body's performance? The answer came on the treadmill. At the end of the six-week program, Chuck was making better use of his oxygen. That's it, just settle in there. When tested at a typical training pace, his running was definitely okay, more efficient. Okay. Fantastic. How you doing, Chuck, okay? okay. Now, the critical test. How long could he run flat out? The result, almost twice as long as the 61 seconds he managed at the start of the program. A tremendous benefit for a runner who must draw on all his resources in the final exhausting moments of a race. But could his improvements have been simply the product of a good attitude? It would be easy to assume that perhaps this is just positive thinking. However, we had a group of people in the study who learned about the skills and discussed the skills, but never practiced them, never developed the skills themselves. And they did not have any change on the treadmill, even though they had a very positive attitude towards their performance. Chuck Sherline is one of the first athletes to try improving his performance through the relaxation response. And already in several disorders where stress complicates the disease, the relaxation response, an innate resource we all possess, has begun to play a useful role in treatment. But scientists are only beginning to understand the mechanisms by which mind can affect body, and clearly, they have a long way to go. What state is growing bigger by the day? The answer is Hawaii, thanks to this brand new flow of lava. Join me next time on our special Hawaiian edition of Discover the World of Science. Discover the World of Science is made possible by a grant from a major producer of lighting products, of precision materials, and a world leader in products and services for telecommunications. The company is GTE. For a transcript, send $4 to Discover Transcripts, 3 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016.